American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. man a small flour cake with his meat. Uh, yes, Captain Clark. Cake? What is this, Billy? A special occasion? <laughs> Did you find the headwaters of the Columbia just over the hill? Not exactly, Meriwether. It happens to be August 1st, 1805. 35 years ago, I was born. I'd forgotten. Congratulations. Many happy returns of the day. 18 days, it'll be your birthday. I hope we'll have horses by then, because in 18 days, we'll run out of river. Sacagawea, why do your people keep on hiding from us? The rifle makes the death noise. No matter who fires it, friend or enemy, it sends my people into flight. We can't do without the hunting parties, not unless we want to starve. As soon as my ankle is better, I'm going looking for Shoshonas. How about me doing that today? I thought you had a sick stomach. It's as easy to be sick hunting Shoshones as it is pulling a boat up, uh, Reverend. Maybe easier. Why not take Sergeant Gas with you? He hurt his back, can't use a pole, but he can walk. All right. Gas and uh, George Ria. He's better at sign language than any of us in case we meet the Shoshone. Uh, may I go, Captain Lewis? You, Charbonneau? Uh, my uncle will not stand the tow rope or the pushing pole, but I can walk. <laughs> Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter 6, Shoshone Country. Although the summer sun burned down upon the toiling men of the Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery, on August 1st, 1805, winter weather was only a month away in the high country they traveled. Today, that country is part of the state of Idaho. Officers and men knew they had to have Shoshone horses and guides once they left the natural track of the river. Finding these Indians was now a matter of life and death, and it drove four men into the rugged wilderness. Meriwether Lewis with an ailing stomach, Sergeant Patrick Gass with a sprained back, Toussaint Charbonneau with a bad leg, and Georges Drouillard, reasonably sound and healthy. Forty-five miles in the last two days, by my calculations. Oh, oh, mon Dieu, that, that is too far for a cripple. Oh, no wonder my leg hurts. All hurt if we don't find Indians. Captain Lewis. Yes, Sergeant. My back, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I... I can't go no further. You look uh, tired or thin, Captain. Why we don't rest here? Have to keep on. Stop, we'll never start again. Oh, my leg. The girl it went out from under me. Don't move. Rest it. I'd better rest, too. My back is killing me. Gas, can you and Charbonneau find your way to the river? After we rest, yes, sir. Boat shouldn't be far behind. They'll pick you up. George, let's keep moving. Yes, sir. Sometimes you can sense that the Indians are near, hiding behind the trees, watching from behind bushes and rocks. Why they do not stop running long enough to find out what our intentions are. Sakajewea keeps saying they're afraid. They don't care about our intentions. They just want to stay away from us. No, that is too bad. I... George. Now. Oh, my back. Stay still. Let me see if you have any broken bones. <clears throat> My shoulder's all right. Ribs are sound. I spent half my life in the wilderness. You'd think I would have 
enough sense by now to watch where I put my feet. Would you not? Just take it easy. You, you'll feel better in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Instead of easing, the pain grew worse. There was only one thing to do. Rejoin the main party. It took two hours of fighting our way through thorns, briars, and prickly pear before we reached the river and found Billy Clark and the men in camp. With them were Charbonneau and Gas. I didn't expect to see you two so soon. George had a bad fall. He wrenched his back. Oh, sit by the fire, George. A little heat ought to ease the pain. Uh, thank you, Captain. You all right, Merriweather? A little tired. Any Indians? Not a sign. I was hoping you'd have better luck. We've had a miserable time of it. Turns very fast. Only way we've been able to move is with double man tow ropes, oars, and poles. We must have passed ahead of navigation some miles ago. If we had horses, I'd just as soon never look at this river again. Uh, horses. Uh, we did see a Shoshona footprint yesterday. Where? Twenty miles down river. Sergeant Ordway followed tracks to a campsite only a mile away, but no Indians. Merriweather, I think it's plain we're not going to meet any Shoshonas. Not unless we corner them. A few more days pass during which we confined ourselves to the battle with the narrowing river. Reconnoitering ahead of the main party, George Driar, his back much improved, and I, came to a fork in the river. After we determined that the left fork was the correct route, we left a marker for Billy Clark on a stick driven into the bank. And then the two of us moved on toward the other fork following a recent Indian trail. <laughs> What is it, Sergeant Gaz? What river do I take, sir? Any markers? No markers, sir. Well, then keep right. Yes, sir. Soon I could see that the fork we followed was dwindling into some sort of backcountry creek. We managed several miles by dint of towing, poling, and rowing. Then up ahead, Merriweather Lewis and George Duryar appeared from the brush and began waving at us. I look sharp. Captain Lewis and Julia are ahead. Put in the shore, Sergeant Gass. We'll camp here for the night. Yes, sir. Who's that? Right, water. Merriweather waved and yelled that I couldn't make out what he wanted. When he realized we were heading for shore, he lapsed into silence and calmly waited for us. As soon as my boat touched the bank, I leaped out. Bill, you came up the wrong river. Wrong river. I saw no markers. That meant hold my course. But there was a marker. George left one. Yes, sir. On a willow stick jammed in the bank where uh, you couldn't miss it, sir. Oh, I saw nothing. Neither did Sergeant Gas. Uh, Captain Luis, may I go back and find out what happened? Go ahead. Uh, no real harm done, I guess. We can turn back in the morning and take the correct port. Captain Clark, Captain Luis, look. The shining mountain. They're beautiful. This saddle-shaped path. Do you see it? Oh, yes. It's to the right of you, Billy. My people use it to journey to the western slopes. It is called the Lemhai. You mean the slopes that go on down to the Pacific? That is what the wise men say, to the salt sea. Well, then it's the Continental Divide. If it was a month earlier, we might be able to go through on foot without horses. Soon the snows will fall deep in the Lemhai. About the time the cooks were preparing our supper... George Duryar returned. Captain Luis. What did you find out, George? Well, never fasten a marker to a green, freshly cut willow stick. That is a beaver food. <laughs> you mean to say that a beaver ate the marker? Yes, sir. Uh, the paper was lying in the mud. All around there was beaver track, and there was teeth marks in what was left of the stick. <laughs> The trip back to the Forks produced a double accident. One of the boats capsized in the tricky, swirling current, dumping its cargo into the water. Trying to right the boat, Private Joe Whitehouse slipped on the rocks and incurred painful injuries. We spent an entire day recovering and drying out the spilled cargo, and I treated the contusions and sprains of Private Whitehouse. Finally, we turned upriver in the right direction, and it was back to the ropes and poles. 
For two days, high winds blew water at us, keeping us thoroughly drenched. On the night of August 8th, when we made camp, I could literally feel the discouragement of the men. Sergeant Judge! Yes, Captain Clark? How are the men? They're worn out, sir. Are they still with us? Well, sir, I guess they feel the way I do, most of them, anyhow. You got us this far. You'll get us the rest of the way. I hope so. In the morning, I'm going out to find Indians. I'll take Drea, Shields, and McNeil. Tell them to get ready. Yes, sir. Tell them we'll stay out indefinitely. We're not coming back until we find Shoshone. Look out! Nick! Watch it, McNeil! Thank you, George. Hmm. That could have been trouble. It looks to me like about ten miles of grassland ahead before we reach the hills. We'll spread out. If you men pick up a trail, I want my attention. Put your hat on the muzzle of your rifle and hold it high. Yes, sir. The grass was almost as high as our heads, a paradise for cattle. We moved ahead for about 15 minutes, and then I spotted a horseman directly ahead of me, perhaps two miles distant. I examined him through my telescope. He answered Sacagawea's description of a Shoshone warrior, and he rode an elegant horse. He didn't see us at first, for at most only our heads showed above the sea of grass. I concentrated on moving closer and closer to him, and a look to either side showed me that Driar, Shields, and McNeil were doing the same. And then the warrior saw us. One by one, by the way, his head jerked apprehensively from right to left. I signaled the men. Driar responded by halting, but the other two plowed on. The Indian sat his horse like an equestrian statue. I moved on, on. And then 50 yards from him, I cried out the only two Shoshone words I knew, the words for white man. Tababone! 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 Truyar had caught the thought and was helpfully echoing me. I put down my rifle lifted my blanket and spread it on the ground three times in the traditional Plains Indian gesture of friendship. It had little or no effect because Shields and McNeil emerged from the tall grass and moved stolidly and steadily toward the Indian. Shields! McNeil! Halt! Halt! They kept on as if they had heard nothing. Suddenly the warrior wheeled his horse and galloped away. I was filled with anger. I ran ahead, Ruyar angling along with me to where the other two men finally stopped. Sorry, sorry. He ran away. What did you expect? Why did you ignore the order to halt? Well, uh, I don't know, except I thought I could grab the bridle of his horse. Shields, when I want you to use your own initiative, I'll tell you. That Indian might still be here if you and McNeil had obeyed orders. Now get over there and bring me my rifle. Yes, sir. Wait. Hmm. No use my taking out my disappointment on you. After you get my rifle, we're going to that hill over there. We're going to build a big fire and eat breakfast where people for miles around can locate us. No invading war party would ever do that. Captain, uh, do you want me to go out and shoot something for depart? No shooting. That'll alarm all Shoshones within earshot. Ah, yes, you are right. I brought some pemmican. We'll heat it. Yes, sir. I start the fire. After we ate... We went back to where we had encountered the Shoshone warrior. His trail was easy to follow. We stayed on it for about a mile. And then big drops of rain splattered against my cheek. Hey, you really come down. Take shelter under that tree. And McNeil, over here. We huddled in the circle of comparative dry provided by the tree. After about an hour, the rain slackened and stopped. We went back to the trail, only to find it had been completely obliterated by the rain. Uh, it looked like the weather is on their side. All right, one warrior got away. It only means that we start over. Mm. I want you to spread out within hailing distance. Look for more signs. (laughs) 
After several hours, I picked up what seemed to be a frequently used trail. I called in the men, and we moved ahead in a group. The trail became a footpath as it led in a series of turns downhill. And suddenly we came upon three Shoshone squaws. The youngest ran, but the other two apparently resigned themselves to death. They sat down, lowering their heads submissively. Tababone. Tababone. The two women betrayed no emotion as George repeated the Shoshone words. I took the older woman's hand and put a string of beads into it. She raised her eyes and smiled in a sort of vast relief. We bestowed more baubles upon them, giving each, in addition, a pewter mirror and a pot of a million. George, talk to them in sign language. Tell them we want to go to their village. All right. I try, sir. As Druyar made his signs, the youngest woman returned. We gave her gifts while Druyar seemed to make the two older ones understand that we came as friends and wished to parley with the chief. At last, the eldest woman rose, motioned for us to follow, and started down the footpath. Soon the path lost itself in a clearing, and ahead was a large Shoshone village. The entire village displayed excitement at our arrival. Aching the gestures of Guya, we made the sign of peace over and over. Presently, we were before a medium-sized man who had the look of authority about him. George Druyar spoke to him in signs, and the chief gravely replied. The entire exchange had a kind of rhythmic style about it, and more to the point, it brought results. The chief, named Kamiawe, and his aides, greeted us by pressing their greasy painted faces against ours. Soon we were streaked with their paint. But the important thing was that we had established a friendly relationship with them. I felt a considerable relief as we were led to a lodge to rest. I've had enough of this hugging and mugging, unless they want to introduce me to some of the younger women. You just think that you've had enough shields. If you want to stay out of trouble, leave the women alone. Yes, sir. George, I was relieved when the chief understood. Almost always you can put across the main ideas with signs. Uh, where you miss sometimes is with the little things. The shadings. But we'll depend on Sacagawea for that. Uh, the chief say uh, there will be a pipe smoking in about an hour. Uh, I ought to know what to ask for after you give him the gift. Uh, tell him there's another big chief with us at the river with the boats. We'll need horses to move the baggage from there to here. Uh, w when we're all assembled, we'll have a big powwow and establish trade relations between our two nations. I guess there's a meal connected with this, Captain. I saw some squaws at the cooking pot. I hope so. I'm hungry. Uh, me too. The meal was some sort of local root vegetable boiled, a single scant helping per person. We ate it and looked about. That was a meal? The Shoshones seem to think so. Game is hard to find at this altitude this time of year. I've seen only a pair of old muskets uh, among the braves. They must depend on bows and arrows. The ritual began. Part of the ceremony was the pulling off of moccasins, a meaningful act in this country of the prickly pear. A shoeless man was completely at the mercy of a man with something on his feet. Then we passed the pipe, each taking a couple of puffs. With McNeil and Shields as assistants, I handed out gifts, including medallions and flags for the chief and his aides. They were pleased and seemed well disposed to watch George as he went through a series of signs and gestures. Then he sat down, and we watched the chief. I was very eloquent. The chief is agreeable to it all. Then a younger man jumped up frowning and went into an angry, jerky series of gestures. Uh-uh. -oh. Trouble, Captain. So I gather. He is saying it is all a trick to enslave the chief. There is an ambush at the river. Straighten him out, George. Yes, I try. George's signs were so vivid and expressive that the rest of us caught the full meaning. The suspicious warrior was mistaken. There was no ambush. Would Chief Kamir Wade and his aides be courageous enough to come and find out? 
or were they fit only to stay home with the old women? Glowering indignantly, Tamir Waite made reply. His personal courage was beyond question. He would go with us, and the best Shoshone horses would also go to carry our party and our baggage. Nothing would stop him from meeting with the other big chief of the Pale Faces. There is food for the Shoshones, a real treat. A hundred and twenty pounds of venison if it is an arm. I should have reserved some of it for us instead of promising it all to come here, Wade. <laughs> I'll remember with the next one, sir. If there is a next one. <laughs> we watched the Shoshones. It was plain from the way they fell upon the deer that their diet had been skimpy from necessity, not choice. They tore at the flesh, broke the bones, ate the meat raw on the spot. Turns my stomach to watch him. It's not exactly Tidewater Society manners. Hunger is seldom a pretty sight. We set out for the river, filled stomachs, putting the Indians in a much more amiable mood. When we arrived two hours ahead of the main party, the Indians soon became restive. I tried my hand at calming them, and so did George Druya. And then, to my great relief, I heard the boats. Soon our men appeared with Billy, Charbonneau, and Sacagawea leading the way. Ara, what are you did it? You found them. Shoshone, my people. Oh, gee, such fine horses. Come me away. Come me away. Sobbing with joy, Sacagawea rushed forward and threw herself at the Shoshone chief. Momentarily, he was surprised, even indignant, until he recognized her. Then he held her tight and made joyous sounds and stroked her hair. Hey, Charbonneau, they're glad to see each other, aren't they? Maybe that's her first husband, huh? No, oh, no. I am her only husband. Uh, looks to me like she's ready to make a trade, Charbonneau. Uh, if you did not wear stripes, I would tear off your arms and hold you down the hill like a rubber ball. Well, that's enough, guys. That's enough. Let him alone. Yes, sir. Captain Clark. Captain Lewis. Thank you. I am happy. This is my brother. My beloved brother. At the village lives also my sister. Oh, that can't be. That only happens in storybooks. Ah, ah, you see, little fat sergeant, I am the only husband. Ah. At first, it seemed like a family gathering. Sacagawea, the sister of the chief. White robes were spread for me and Meriwether to sit on during the trading and the bargaining. Opposite us sat Kamiowait and several sub-chiefs. Sacagawea was beside me, ready to interpret. Sacagawea, tell them our nation is a mighty one. Tell them that we will provide them with all the necessities on a constant basis if they trade us horses and guides for our trek through the Lemhi Pass and on toward the Western Sea. I will do so. Sacagawea converted Meriwether's words to Shoshona. And as she spoke, Camille Waite frowned and shook his head. He says, no guide and no horses. Horses are the only wealth of the Shoshone people. But he has many horses. Pastured near the villages, a herd of at least 400. Doesn't he want to trade some of them for weapons to fight off raiders from the plains people? She turned back to speak at length. And this time, Camille Waite was very thoughtful. His answer was a long time in coming... But it was a fair one. My brother says, if you can provide many rifles and many bullets for him, he will give you horses and guides. He wants the rifles now. Tell Camille Wait that establishing trade between his nation and the United States of America is not easy. First, we must go to the Pacific Sea and then go back to speak for Camille Wait to Mr. Jefferson, our president. Then many authorized traders will come with rifles and many other valuables. Sacagawea spoke once again to her brother. After a fairly long exchange, Camille Waite agreed. We could have horses and guides. Billy Clark and a detail of men took the next few days to reconnoiter the country ahead and found it very rugged. I spent the time dickering with Camille Waite with the invaluable help of Sacagawea. 
and getting the men ready for the difficult overland travel ahead. We'll have to make another cast, George. Yes, sir. That much left to carry over the pass. Uh, do you want me to tell uh, Sergeant Pryor and Crozat? No, I'll do that after these curious Indians stop hanging around camp and go back to the village. Uh, how many horses we will have, Captain? Nineteen. But we need at least twenty-five, and even that means some of us will always be on foot. Well, uh, what we will do to get the extra horses, I mean. Camille waits got plenty of horses. I know. All I can do is play on his desire for rifles. I'll try him again at the last minute. Maybe, uh, Sakajawi. Hello! Hey! Hope! Hope! Running fast, George caught up with the Indian. Terrified, the thief knocked the primer out of the rifle so he wouldn't get shot, dropped the weapon, and raced away. George picked it up and returned to me, grumbling. There's one thing I can say, Captain. They sure are bad off for rifle. I hate to do it, but maybe I can use this incident when I talk again with the chief. Hey, Captain Lewis, Sacagawea brings good news. Some good news, Captain, and some bad. First, I talked long to my brother. He will give 29 horses. That's fine, Sacagawea. Ah, see? <laughs> I said it was good news, and huh? Now the bad part. In the past, we will meet Flathead Indians. They are warlike? No. They come to join my people. All will go to the buffalo country to hunt. You're afraid our guides will desert and go on the hunt? My brother expects the guides to desert. They are good hunters. Well, come on, we'll go get a clear understanding right now. George, you and Charbonneau scour these woods and see if you can get a couple of deer as a gift for the village. Oh, yes, Captain. Come on, Charbonneau. Uh, yes, my irritation must have showed when we reached Camille Waits Lodge in the village. Hastily, he summoned his sub-chiefs, and we began to talk. Through Sacagawea, I pointed out how his niggardly attitude regarding the horses and his knowledge that the guides would desert us would certainly not increase his chances of getting firearms from my country. I insisted that he issue definite orders to the guides in the presence of Sacagawea. They were to stay with us as long as we needed them. This was done, and we returned to camp to find that Billy Clark had returned. I hear you've had your troubles. It's been hard trading, but the crisis is past. We have 29 horses, and the guides are pledged not to desert. But still, you must watch them over the Lemhai. Oh, we will. If you will excuse me, I, I go to prepare for the trail. The trail? I assumed you would stay with your brother, your people. First, I thought so also. Now, you are more my people. I go with you. The next day, we started for the pass, traveling over harsh and inhospitable country. But we traveled with the heaviest burdens on the backs of horses, and guided by a Shoshone father and his four sons. It grew colder and more desolate, and I felt very sober as I sat before the campfire that night in the Lemhi Pass. It began to snow. Snow on the 18th day of August snow on my 31st birthday. You have been listening to Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Chapter 6, Shoshone Country, starred Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark. Featured in the cast were Carl Swenson, Sebastian Cabot, Helen Gerald, Bill Quinn, and Jim Bowles. Our story was written by Carl A. and William Tunberg and directed by William Lally. Sound patterns by Gene Twombly. Michael Rye speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.